you'll notice, I've actually known Michelle for a long time. Um, I used to crash on the couch at her flat when I came up from Timaru, where despite what you've read on Wikipedia, I was not born. Uh, but I actually heard Michelle once sign off a phone conversation with Revolution in Aotearoa in 1982. <laughs> <laughs> Getting there. But, you know, they, her and her friends used to go into town and preload on socialism. <laughs> They'd still end up fighting and vomiting in the gutter. <laughs> they felt better about it. Now, one of the key people, not just in today's event, but in Fabian's whole drive to get New Zealanders talking about economic alternatives, <coughs> has been Selwyn Pellet. Uh, as the ship's observer, he's going to set the scene before our speakers. Please welcome him. Firstly, welcome for coming. Um, really great to see such a diverse audience here. Um, just picking up on the tail end of the, of the Comedian Act, I wonder um, how many of you think that economics makes sense? That you think that you should do exactly what your selfish nature determines, or whether you can actually decide to do something different. When our forebears built dams and roads and trains, it didn't make sense economically for them to do that. <coughs> But it made sense for us. We had a conversation last night saying, why didn't Dubmire and Robinson drive through the infrastructure that we would so valuably have today? But we're making those same decisions now for the next generation. Anyway, my goal here today is to introduce the Titanic. So why the Titanic? And by the way, I'll need a little clicky thing. So why the Titanic? Well, there's a lot of similarities today between where we're at and where the Titanic's at. When they got on the, when they got on the Titanic, they were all excited and it was a great ship and it was built with excess in mind. Every, it was opulent. Everyone had a great time and the whole lead up to this event today was about getting you excited to turn up to something and then tell you you're on the Titanic. Imagine, they didn't know they were on the Titanic. They didn't know it was going to end in tragedy. They thought they were on the change of a lifetime experience. Hundreds of steerage class passengers off to start a new life. That's us, folks. That's, we're here, we're on a great ship. And it feels really good, but we're facing some very dire times. So one of the things I always do when I see people up the front, is I say, why the hell are they here? What's their motive? Who, who the hell are they? What, have they? what right have they got to tell me what to think? And we're not. But I'll tell you how I got here. I got here by trying to drive an export business. And then I thought, this doesn't make sense. So I better talk to some politicians about why this doesn't make sense. And then I started getting an industry together, and then I got a sector together, and then eventually I ended up standing in front of you saying, there are some things that are fundamentally wrong. And the biggest thing that's wrong is when people like me with money stop investing in our economy because of what's wrong. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, systemic problems that lead to failure. <coughs> so, so you can choose to listen to the we aren't as bad as it seems and our economy is actually doing okay. You can choose to do that and partly it's true. Our economy is like the Titanic in that it's dangerous waters and it appears right now to be rudderless. Some of the actions that have taken place in the last budget and I mean I just shrug my shoulders and say we, we changed billions of dollars around in tax. Now we're looking for pennies. How did that happen? And how did we swallow it? How are we sitting here, everyone's up in arms about the teachers, but we swallowed that particular pill a couple of years ago. Cutting spending and getting into surplus is an accountant's vision. It's not mine. And it falls way short of the sort of visions we should have as a country. If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always had. 
Well, actually, we had a much better life in the past, and right now we're continuing to follow farming, and some of the debate that's going to come up is going to be talking about the profitability of farming, and it can't sustain the lifestyle that we've got, so we have to do things differently. There was a whole bunch of people on the Titanic, and they came from all walks of life. And I've just finished reading a great big book about it, and probably most of the people here have done a lot of research, and it's a sad, sad story. And you realise that these very influential people were playing with people's lives. They were making really reckless decisions on behalf of 2,227 people who didn't get to say a thing, like you. Decisions are made behind doors and you don't get to say whether you like it or not and are reckless decisions. Well, they certainly were on the Titanic. Just to give you some examples, the Board of Trade decided that they did a formula and they worked out, you only needed a volume, they worked out the volume of a person and they said, so this volume times this, you have to have this many lifeboats based on the volume. And they had a table that worked out how many people. It stopped at 10,000 tonnes, because at that stage there were no vessels greater than 10,000 tonnes. The Titanic was 46,000 tonnes, but only needed the same amount of lifeboats as a boat that was 10,000 tonnes. So the government let the people down. Just one example. Second example on the, Olymp the Olympic was Titanic's sister ship. They decided to put more cabins on board the Titanic to get more revenue. They threw two of the lifeboats on top of those cabins. They weighed two tons. There was no way of launching them. So these reckless, careless decisions <coughs> impact us, the population. So Titanic... It had no plausible plan B, but it had a very plausible plan A. Its plan A was actually, you know, I, I venture to say if most of us went through the technical drawings and understood exactly what their proposal was, their argument was the ship was unsinkable. It was unsinkable, it was the lifeboat. It would not sink. It had all sorts of things that were positive about it, but the plan B, should all of those things fail, there was only enough lifeboats for 55% of the people there. And that assumes that it doesn't capsize on one side, which would have reduced it to 22.5% of the people. There was no plan B. Can anyone tell me what our plan B is? We've backed farming for hundreds of years, but there is no plan B. What happens if there's foot and mouth? What, 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 what? We're a debt-laden country, and we don't have a plan B in very bad economic times. But we have a lot of debt, but it isn't government debt. We listen to debt, 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 debt. Our debt as a government is less than 30% of GDP. It's low by world standards. Why we're breaking our ass to get into surplus is beyond me. We could be spending on infrastructure, the very infrastructure that our forebearers thought was a good idea for us, that we're now flicking off to improve our standard of living for us today and leaving our kids in debt. I know it's easy, in fact it's even desirable, to pretend that things are okay. They just aren't. Until we make our economy more robust, we're going to have this systemic failure going on. And to make it more robust, we have to make it broader. And there's a lot of things that you'll hear about today that are very important about protecting our economy. And the interesting thing is, this is a graph of those that perished. And you'll see there, even taking the woman and children policy aside, you can see who suffers the most. And again, casual decisions made by people. Third-class passengers were actually locked below deck. They were locked by the US immigration, who, would, who was fearful of the contamination or spreading of diseases. So they actually separated third-class passengers from the rest. So when it came time for, to get to the lifeboats, 
they were way behind the queue, which is why you've got such a high death rate amongst second and third class passengers. The same is happening here. The economy is starting to bite, and it's biting at the bottom of the pyramid most. So, <coughs> largely what we'll be talking about today, and this is my personal five icebergs, this is the way I see the economy, and it's very complicated for me to explain, and I can't today, I don't have time, but there are five major icebergs in my world, and number one is the biggest one, and it's the one I hate. It's the destruction of the real economy, the tradable economy, the economy that creates jobs and brings in income <coughs> from overseas through speculative flows of capital from offshore. Every time you buy a second house and you mortgage it, what you're doing is you're taking money out of the Australian economy and you're leveraging up our national debt you're increasing our debt as a country, which increases the interest rate, which increases the exchange rate, which happens to destroy everyone who's trying to export and earn. Now that's how, and that cycle is just going on and on and on until, we see some graphs later on, the real economy is dying. And that is fundamentally what's behind the destruction of our economy and the, and the standard of living that we're used to. So, with that, I'll, I'll leave the other four icebergs to be discussed by the other speakers. Thanks very much.